محمد و آل محمد صلوات اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم والحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على اشرف الانبیاء والمرسلین حبیب الہ العالمین ابی القاسم محمد رب اشرح لی صدری ویسر لی امری وحل العقدت من لسان یفقه قولی رسائی فاتحہ فر آل المؤمنین المؤمنات المعترض و اسلام بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهتنا الصلاة والسلام على الذين آمنوا اللهم قال الله جل وعلا في محكم كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم أعهد إليكم يا بني آدم ألا تعبدوا الشيطان إنه لكم عدو مبين ونعبدوني هذا صراط مستقيم In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Holy Quran Did we not take an oath from you, O children of Adam that you shall not serve Satan He is your, he is your open enemy and that you shall serve me, this is the straight path. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, we have been given another opportunity to be amongst the guests of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this holy month of Ramadan. For the next two weeks, we are going to be taking on the subject of shaitan and how he misguides and the tricks and the plays and the plots and the tricks that he uses out of his own plague book to misguide mankind and the reason being is that in order for us to obey Allah we must first disobey shaitan and that's why when we say la ilaha illallah we say la ilaha then we say illallah so we deny all those uh, to be worshipped other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as we are living as Muslims and followers of Al Muhammad you come and you find that there is a purpose uh, for what is happening there are reasons many reasons why you have Islamophobia in the time and the age that we live in so you have to ask yourself, why is all this evil going on and who is behind all the evil in the world? You may have many names that may come across the board as those who are performing those evil acts such as ISIS, such as uh, Al-Qaeda, such as uh, whatever terrorist groups you have in Pakistan killing the innocent Shia over there, whether uh, governments such as the, the Saudi Kingdom, uh, you have uh, many uh, governments out there, satanic governments, who uh, promote uh, the teachings and the, uh, of uh, evil. And the ones, the only one, the one and only creation that is behind that is the shaitan. So inshallah, as we go along with this series, you will find... Uh, you will discover that these uh, tricks and plots that the shaitan has tried to plant uh, against the, the followers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will find that uh, these tricks are very visible in what you see uh, happening in today's world. Like for example, I mentioned today in Salat al-Jum'ah that uh, the Saudi kingdom, uh, their uh, the only reason why they're attacking Yemen is because they have a fear of Iranian influence in the region. 
just out of fear, they're attacking the people. They have no proof of that. But my question is, why are you attacking the Yemeni people? If your problem is with the Iranian people, why don't you go there? See, this is one of the qualities and attributes of the uh, shaitan, and we're going to speak about that tomorrow. But today we're just going to speak about who is shaitan. So this is a quality of the shaitan that he does not attack the person he has a problem with. He goes to the weak one, the weak person. And you find that Allah, that he had a problem, his problem wasn't with Adam. His problem was with Allah. So if your problem is with Allah, why don't you go and take it out with Allah? Why are you taking it out on the children of Adam? What did we do to you? We didn't do anything to you. But no, he said, I will deceive all of them, all of the children of Adam. So now we come to Shaitan himself. Who is Shaitan? Shaitan, what's his job? When you go and, for example, you want to get to know a person, you go and tell him, Hi, you know, how are you? What's up? How's it going? You know, uh, you ask him, uh, What do you do? What's your job? So there's a job description for each person person right so what's the job uh, what's shaitan's job his job he has taken this job upon himself to misguide the people but Allah what does he want to do he wants to guide the people now we have several questions that come up to our mind the first question which is would it have been better if Allah did not create shaitan and why did Allah make shaitan? Why did He create him? The answer to that question is that Allah did not create shaitan. Allah, He created a jinn that turned into shaitan. He created a jinn. But He turned into shaitan. He became Iblis. Because we know that the purpose of the jinn, the creation of jinn and mankind is what? In Surah al Surah 51, verse 56, what does Allah say? He says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created jinn or mankind but to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this Iblis, he was created as a jinn to worship Allah. But he became shaitan. For example, you have many uh, characters uh, in the, for example, in the Islamic center, we come to the masajid, right? I'll give you an example. We come to the center and we uh, see those, uh, you know, little uh, kids, you know, some of them may have more energy than the others, you know. They're the ones that tend to be uh, uh, in the timeouts in Sunday school and out in the hallways and somehow, some way they end up in the principal's office. Uh, so what do we say about those kids? Sometimes we call them, we, we say about them, he's a shaitan, he's a shaitan, right? He's a little devil, right? So if we were to go to the mother or the father and ask, uh, you know, go up to them, ask them a simple question, uh, why did you uh, create a, a, a devil? Why did you bring a devil to birth? Why did you give birth to a devil? What would the answer be? The answer would be, oh, Maulana, you know, we, we always, it wasn't our intention to give birth to a shaitan. My intention was to give birth to a salih, to a good mu'min, to a good, you know, mu'min, a believing, God-fearing, and doing the namaz on time, and praying all the time. That wasn't my intention. So this was the same thing to bring it close to our uh, imagination, is that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He created, uh, He created uh, the, um, He created shaitan, He created him, He did not make him into a shaitan, He created him into a jinn, and His intention was not to uh, make him uh, into a shaitan to mislead the people. Just like it was not the intention for the uh, brother or sister to bring uh, forth a havoc and give a heart attack to that principle. Salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So you find that, okay, fine, Allah, you did not create this shaitan, you did not make him into Iblis, you did not make him into shaitan. But why did you let him live? 
If you knew that he was going to harm the human being and mislead him and make him do all of these things, why did you let him live to misguide the people? Because you have, oh Allah, you have the power to say, kun fayakun, be and it will be and that's it, it will perish, it will vanish. Or you find that one of the reasons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept shaitan alive was is the reason being is because it's necessary for the growth of the mu'min. Now you may ask me, oh, how is it possible? Shaitan necessary for the growth, for my growth as a mu'min? Yes, it's necessary for the growth of a mu'min. And there are many blessings that we have because of shaitan's existence. For example, you have many things that we could not have proven without shaitan's existence. Like, and I will mention there are five benefits to the existence of shaitan. For example, shaitan came to misguide mankind. Right? And Allah, he came to guide mankind. So shaitan wanted to take the people away from Islam. You have the prophets, for example, beginning from Prophet Adam and ending with our last and the seal of all prophets, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa alayhi wa alayhi wa So when these prophets, one by one, when it began from Adam to Ibrahim to Isa to Musa to Nuh, and then ending with uh, Prophet Muhammad, we find that all the prophets, they were coming down with their proofs to the people giving their proofs that all the existence of Allah and the heavens and the earth and all of that good stuff, they were coming out with their proofs. But you find that there is one proof that they did not, they could not defend. They did, shaitan had an argument that the prophets did not, could not defend that argument. There was only one. And shaitan kept on hitting on that argument and that proof. And his proof was that you, the prophets, yes, you come down with all of these proofs and all of these arguments, and you say that you are the representative of God, and all of these people should follow me, should follow you, to follow Islam. But the thing, the fact of the matter is, is that I'm older than all of you. Allah created me before He created all of you. And I, the shaitan, I see you, I see you in diapers before you were born as the prophet. Shaitan is saying this. But he is saying that I am older than you. So what is he trying to tell us? He is trying to tell us that he is older than, he is trying to bring the argument forth of the eldest. I am the eldest, so you should follow me. Like for example, which Muslim uh, which Muslim would agree, uh, would disagree that shaitan is not the, the eldest? Right? There isn't anyone. anyone. Everyone would agree that shaitan is the oldest. Okay, so if shaitan is the oldest, then, uh, you know, because in order for us to be considered a Muslim, we have to believe in what Allah mentions in the Quran and he does mention that shaitan is the oldest. Okay, so if shaitan is the oldest, then what does that mean? That's, that's a benefit. That's one of the benefits of his existence. Why? Because it's the best proof that age does not matter. What matters is that you are right. And what matters is the truth. Because if you come and you say that we should listen to shaitan because he is older, then, then we have to come and to listen to those who say that the majority or the, the elder is right. And you, how do you find this? You find this when you come to Imam Ali alayhi salatu wasalam. If you come and you say that Ali is younger and we don't accept him because the other Khalifas are older, then you should also come and accept Shaitan as your leader because he is older. This is the first benefit of Shaitan's existence. So Shaitan is letting us know 
that age does not matter. He is coming and destroying that argument. Therefore, the first thing that Shaitan is teaching us, that age has nothing to do with it. So it doesn't matter if you're old, if you're young, if you're an infant. What matters is the truth. What matters is haq. And we said that if, even if you're an infant, we have the example of Jesus, peace be upon him. When he spoke in the cradle, he was only an infant. But we listened to him because he spoke the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's the first benefit. The second benefit is that everything that has a life and everything that is created has an expiration date. For example, we may live you know, 40, 50, 60, inshallah, we live to be 200 years, inshallah, may Allah give us all a long life. But unfortunately, there is an expiration date for every living thing in this world, whether it's an animal or a human being. And so you come and you find, for example, those who have lived a long life, for example, Prophet Noah, peace be upon him, he lived over a thousand years. And you come to Shaitan, uh, Shaitan, he is still alive and he is misguiding the people. He was alive 6,000 years before Adam and he is still alive maybe 10,000, even 20,000 years to misguide the people. Now can any Muslim come and say that, uh, that Allah has, that he is dead? Shaitan is dead. No, right? He is still alive. So, Allah has kept him alive and accepted him to live. So if Allah can keep shaitan alive for 20,000 years to misguide the people, then what's wrong with you? If Allah kept the Imam alive for 1,200 years to guide the people. So because of shaitan's existence, we come and we realize the existence of an Imam al-Mahdi Ajrallahu ta'ala faraj al-Sharif. And it is through the life of shaitan we come and we discover the life of the Imam. So you don't have to prove that the Imam is living or he is dead. All you have to do is just to prove shaitan's existence. The second, this was the second benefit. Now, the third benefit of shaitan's existence. For example, uh, you, may say that, uh, you may say that shaitan has misguided me. He has come to me and he has misguided me and he has uh, whispered in my ear and I have uh, committed uh, this uh, sin. Now, uh, someone may come and ask you, okay, so shaitan misguided you. Uh, did you see him? And you say, no, I did not see him uh, with my own eyes. Uh, because he is hidden. Uh, so you're saying that, uh, that this one creature, uh, his name is Shaitan, he misguided you and he's hidden. And uh, Allah kept him alive. And he's hidden and he's misguiding you. Uh, so, it's, so it shouldn't be hard for you uh, to think that, you know, since Shaitan is hidden and he's misguiding you, uh, it's possible that Allah kept the 12th Imam alive, unseen, but he is guiding the people. Therefore, you don't need to bring ayat and ahadith to show that the Imam is still alive. You only have to prove that shaitan is in ghaybah and he is misguiding the people. And every Muslim, every Muslim, agrees that shaitan is ghaib and is misguiding the people. So if shaitan is ghaib and misguiding the people, then the imam can be ghaib and guiding the people. <laughs> Therefore, the best proof of imam's ghaib is shaitan's wujud, the existence of shaitan. If it wasn't for him, it would be hard to prove that the Imam is still alive and he is in Ghaiba. The fourth benefit of Shaitan's existence is that, for example, imagine an election was held 
And the two parties, one party is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the other party is shaitan. And both of them are on the ballot. Who do you think will win? Any, uh, any guesses? <laughs> so, if you wanted to do a head count to see who has more followers, Allah or the shaitan, you don't really have to go too far to find the results because it's mentioned in the Holy Quran. Allah says in the Quran that if there was an election, I will admit that shaitan will win and I will lose. It's mentioned in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 100. أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَا يؤمنون. He said that the majority will not believe. Allah has already declared that shaitan is the winner. Allah has mentioned that shaitan has more followers than he does. Okay, then the majority is with shaitan. Okay, so now as a Muslim, do we believe in that? Do we believe that shaitan is the majority? Yeah, as a Muslim, every single Muslim has to believe that shaitan is the majority. Okay, so if shaitan is the majority and Allah's followers are less and shaitan's followers are more, so if we come and accept the fact that shaitan has more followers and the majority of the followers are with him and say shaitan is right, then a Muslim, if a Muslim comes and says that we are the majority and you must accept, then accept the majority of shaitan. So do you accept the fact that shaitan has the majority and that you must accept? Do you accept that? They will answer what they answer. We're going to answer no, we can't accept shaitan because he is the majority. Then if you can't accept him as the majority here, then you can't accept him as the majority over there. So therefore, brothers and sisters, haq has nothing to do with age and has nothing to do with majority or minority. Shaitan's existence teaches us that you can be the majority and still be wrong. Because shaitan's followers are more and they are still wrong. Therefore, shaitan teaches us that haq is something majority and minority is something else. Therefore, Allah kept him alive so we can better understand our religion. The fifth and final benefit of shaitan's existence is that shaitan has taught us the difference between worship. Uh, you may come and ask me, brother, what do you mean he has taught us worship? Shaitan? Shaitan. The devil has taught us worship? Yes, he has taught us the difference between worship. Why you may ask me? Well, Allah, for example, he asked everyone to do sajda to Adam. So shaitan did not make sajda. So what did Allah say to him? He said to him, you know, you're dismissed from the heavens, you're dismissed from my presence. You know, leave. He kicked him out. He told him to get out of my court, to get out, I don't want to see you. So shaitan said, okay, I'm going to leave your presence. I'm going to leave. But how about some walking money? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you find like uh, those unfortunate ones who go to uh, jail uh, and then they're finally uh, released. You know, they give them some bus money, you know, some walking money, you know, so they can make it have the fare for the bus ticket. So that was the situation of uh, shaitan. Uh, he needed some walking money. So he goes uh, to uh, Allah and he asks him, he tells him, uh, he tells him, Oh Allah, uh, I don't deserve, uh, I, just, I deserve something. I mean, I did, you know, do uh, worship. I worshipped you for 6,000 years. I was doing sajda and I was doing ibadah and I was doing a rukur. You know, at least give me something for my back, you know. My back, you know, having some back issues, you know, from some like back breaking going on here, you know. I just need some, uh, you know, give me something, you know, to work with. So, you find that. You know, Shaitan, he did that for 6,000 years. If we come, we worship Allah for six years, you know, and we want something, you know, for six years. But he did it for 6,000 years, you know. Anyways, so 
uh, shaitan wanted something in return for his worship. So the fifth thing that shaitan teaches us is that he could have asked Allah to forgive him. He could have asked for anything. He could have asked for the heaven Allah would have, would have given it to him. But you find that no one in history has been given the chance that was given to shaitan. But what did he ask for? He asked Allah for a long life. So Allah told him, that's what you want, all that, you know, you could have asked me for anything. You ask me for a long life? Okay, here, take this long life. So, he took this long life, and what did he say? He says, انظرني إلى يوم يبعثون Reprive me until the day they are resurrected. This is why he uh, uh, said to Allah to give him the chance. So, shaitan worshipped Allah, and he made sajda to Allah, and he made ruku'ah to Allah, and he prayed. But when it came time to ask for something in return for his ibadah, what did he ask for in return? He asked for this dunya and this worldly life. So, with this we learn that Allah, the, the value of the worship of Allah should not be given up so easy for something that is worthless and low, such as this dunya and this worldly life. We find that the worship, this is the value that shaitan gave to worship. That Allah, I worshipped you for 6,000 years. But I want something in return in this life. And this is the worship of shaitan. So if you want to practice the worship of shaitan, then we will want the reward in this dunya. Just like how shaitan wanted his reward in this dunya. Oh Allah, for example, we may say, Allah, give me a car, give me a long life, give me a house, uh, anything uh, materialistic. It's good, yes, as a mu'min. Allah will give you these things, but that's not the objective. The objective is not this dunya, and we mentioned this earlier today. That, oh Allah, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana. In this dunya, we want your blessings, and in the akhirah, we also want your blessings and to uh, uh, being a uh, mu'min you will uh, receive these so you find that shaitan taught us that this is the worldly type of worship another example for example when you go to you go to the masjid back home for example if i go back to iraq or you go back to pakistan you see two types of people the old people and the retired people the old people come because they don't have a choice. And the retired people come because they need a job. So you find that these retired people constantly, they come to the mosque and they're praying, say for example, for three months. They come before the adhan and they stay after the dua. So you find that these retired people, they're praying constantly for three months. Then they come to Maulana and they complain. And they say, Oh Maulana, what can I do? I've been praying for three months and still I don't have a job. <laughs> then Maulana says, Okay, what are you praying for? Are you praying for this job? Or are you praying for Allah? So they come and they worship Allah. But in return, they want dunya. They want this dunya. So this was the worship of the shaitan. It was the same thing. He wanted the reward in this uh, dunya. Okay, Molana, we've been praying for three to four months, but we're still not cured. Why? So then the Molana will come and say, are you praying for the for their sickness? Or you're praying for Allah. When you come and you pray Salat, you want to come and pray Salat al dhuhr Do you say, Oh Allah, I pray, night when you salli Salat al dhuhr Qurbatan, so you can cure my sickness. Or we say, Qurbatan ila Allah ta'ala. So the prayer of shaitan means that we are seeking the worldly reward. So the worship of shaitan is that of the dunya, and the worship of the believer is of a different kind.
So the mu'min, the mu'min does not worship to seek the reward in this life. That's not his objective. Rather, he worships Allah to seek the reward in the hereafter. That's why when you worship Allah, again, you worship Him for the akhirah. And you find, for example, uh, you have a house and you want to uh, sell that house to understand the value of things. So, say for example, I say I want to sell this house for a dozen of bananas. When you say this, you are selling yourself too cheap. You do this when you want to get a divorce, for example. <laughs> Why? Because you get six bananas and she gets six bananas. So, you don't sell the house uh, for that price. Otherwise, because you know you won't getting the worth, you won't be getting the worth and the value of that house. Same thing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah wants us to realize the value of our worship. And we'll mention these few points and we will conclude inshaAllah. So Allah wants us to realize the value of obeying Him, of making prostration before Him. Allah says, He says, listen. I know I see that you are worshipping me five times a day and you're fasting and you're giving the zakat and you're donating and you're helping the poor and uh, you're helping uh, you know, your wife sometimes do the groceries you know, you're doing the chores, washing the dishes sometimes you know, I see that you're doing that you know, I want to reward you uh, for that so what does uh, Allah uh, give us uh, in uh, return what does he wants to he wants to reward us and he wants to give us something in return for our worship but you know the fact of the matter is that there is nothing in this dunya that can compensate us for our worship so therefore the worship of the shaitan asks that you get rewarded in this worldly life while the real value of worship of Allah lies in the hereafter. And this is why when you come to the 14 infallibles, you find that the way they worshipped Allah was at a much higher level. And they did not seek the reward of this worldly life or of the Hereafter, they worshipped Allah because they discovered that he was worthy of worship. And this is why when you come to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, Salam Allah alayhi, you find that he says, Ilahi, ma abattuka khawfin min narik, wa la tama'an fi jannatik. Abattuka li'annuhu wa jattuka ahlun min ibadah. Allah, I do not worship you in fear of your hellfire. And I do not worship you to gain the reward in your hereafter. But the reason why I have come to worship you is because I discovered that you were the one to be, deserved to be worshipped. Therefore, this is the sort of worship that we want. We want to worship Allah, not only for this dunya and the reward of the akhirah. These things will come, brothers and sisters. But we want to worship Allah because we love Him and we have discovered that He is the one that deserves to be worshipped. So with that, I conclude brothers and sisters. And inshallah tomorrow, we will talk about the attributes and the qualities of shaitan. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept these uh, humble uh, words from us, to accept these uh, humble acts when we come to the mosque and we are contributing out of our own time to educate ourselves and to uh, strengthen our relationship with Allah. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to uh, take advantage of this holy month and to strengthen our relationship uh, with Him and to uh, instill the peace and justice uh, around the world just like how it is now filled with oppression and injustice and to hasten the reappearance of our 12th Imam and for the, all the mu'mineen and the mu'minat and deceased and martyrs of Islam, let us all recite Surah Al-Fatiha and three loud salawats ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma